So we've come a long way, and I think a snapshot that shows us where we are now, um, which is useful to refer to, is the Child Protection Minimum Standards. This document was written over about two years by the members of the Child Protection Working Group. And um, it really states what we know so far and what we aspire to achieve in child protection in humanitarian settings. It goes through the sort of preparedness phase and the emergency response phase and then, you know, the, the subsequent uh, recovery. And it's interesting, it was very, very interesting, the process of writing these minimum standards, because we had, we had many, many conversations about what's in and what's out. And some examples of that are um, uh, justice for children. This is not something that is well, well worked on in emergency response. It's actually sometimes seen as almost in opposition to emergency response because um, operational humanitarian organizations who work on, uh, for example, providing psychosocial care to children who've suffered from, you know, different types of violence or, or uh, family separation, um, those, those organizations get, you know, get their work done by working directly with children and families. If at the same time you are reporting on who has done what to those children and trying to get redress for those children, then your access may be limited by the, the powers that be if they feel implicated. So for that reason, we've, some, we've seen a divide historically sometimes between the operational organizations and the organizations working on justice issues or working on accountability for, perp for perpetrators. Um, so uh, uh, it was an interesting debate whether to include a standard on justice for children, and we did that in the end, which was, I think, a great achievement. Um, we all had a similar debate about uh, the worst forms of child labor and whether we really could um, responsibly take that on as a commitment to work on that issue in emergencies, and again, that won the day. There are a couple of issues which didn't make it into the into the minimum standards or very obliquely only, and I think that they're interesting ones to watch to see if in the next iteration um, of these standards they would come in. One is birth registration and different types of um, documentation, which are the cornerstone, some people argue, of child protection. It's very hard to make the case that you're too young to be married or you're too young to be in a uh, fighting in an armed group or an armed force if you can't prove what your age is. So, you know, that, that's, uh, that's an important piece. Um, another, another example would be um, uh, female genital mutilation and cutting or other harmful practices. They are mentioned in passing um, in the Child Protection Minimum Standards, but they're, they're, that's not a very evolved part of the text. So this is just to illustrate, you know, we sort of, in a way, yeah, we took a snapshot of what we felt we could commit to and what we felt we knew at the time. Um, each organization in the group took charge of drafting one or more standards. Um, they convened a, a mixed group around them, including cons uh, um, consulting with field-based colleagues. We had to do a lot of translations uh, to facilitate the consultation at different stages in the development of the standards. And uh, we had a sort of an explicit phase of field level consultation where very deliberately we went to different regions and different emergency affected countries so that we could um, show the standards as they were in their current form, get feedback, improve them. Uh, go back and come again as a global level group together and, and see how the standards fitted once they'd been, you know, um, changed by field level practitioners and, and, and harmonize again. So there were a lot of different stages to get to to, to build this document. Um, and there's just a few things that I think are worth signposting. Um, the document's formatted just like the um, sphere standards. The SPHERE standards are a very long established sort of handbook for humanitarian response and they, uh, they cover a, a small number of, of humanitarian sectors. Our child protection minimum standards are a companion to the SPHERE standards. That means they're consistent with the SPHERE standards, they're approved by the SPHERE board, and they're sort of on the bookshelf with 
these sphere standards. And I, I like to think of it, if, if there was room in the book, <laughs> they'd be inside the, the sphere um, handbook, but that, that uh, that's not possible. And they work, they work very, very well as a standalone document as well. So um, we, we use that format, and it's a very, very accessible format. It's fantastic. It means that you can go, each standard is one sentence. There are 26 of them. And then very quickly, under each standard, you see a, a, a checklist. It's a literally a bullet point checklist of key actions that you can consider that are likely to be relevant. And then um, uh, there are some uh, suggested indicators to help you measure the achievement of the standard and then there are guidance notes that sort of signpost uh, some of the important thinking and dilemmas that typically surround that issue um, and some of the sort of warning signs do this don't do that beware of the other finally there is a, a reference list at the end of each standard and that very importantly does underline each standard with the legal basis uh, on which you know it rests including a reference to the relevant articles of the CRC but um, extending to other conventions which are really important as well. It's worth noting of course that the standards should be contextualized for each humanitarian response and um, that each context will have its own national laws and even customary laws which are very very important to, to build on and strengthen. Um, so these standards uh, establish a few key things. I've said they say what's in, what's out. They also really root everything we do in emergencies in system strengthening. That's one of the principles that's in the introductory section of the book. This debate on how to strengthen child protection systems, even just establishing the notion of a child protection system, sort of analogous to a health system or an education system, is very, very exciting. And it's something which is much, much larger than just humanitarian response. Um, and uh, there, are, there are many, many pieces of research and discussions happening at the moment about, you know, how, how we can cost a child protection system, how these should be designed, um, where, we, where and how we can build them in developing countries, whether they exist already in developed countries and what learning we can draw from, from there, if so. Um, and and for, the, for the emergencies people, we wanted to recognize that our effort is just part of a spectrum and that there's a pre-crisis phase. We hope there'll be post-crisis reconstruction and everything we do in that moment when we're responding as humanitarians, we want to make sure that we're as far as possible laying the groundwork or strengthening what's already there to ensure that at the end we're, we haven't just got a sort of piecemeal list of things going on, a project for street children, a, you know, campaign against sexual violence. No, we've got something holistic and organized, which is developing national capacity, which is working on prevention, not just, you know, running around, putting out fires and responding. Um, it, it's not easy. It's not easy to know how to do that and how to make those difficult decisions about uh, investing your resources in a response now versus training for social workers who, you know, if this situation perpetuates will then be online five years from now you know th these are difficult choices to make and uh, we're certainly still learning about those things uh, but that that's an important principle which I just wanted to flag um, underlying underlying the uh, child protection minimum standards